OK, recording has started. So good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well settled in for another marathon session in the module Legal Implications of Climate Change. So the topic for today's session is here. It's an introduction to the institutional activities of the UN climate change regime. By institutions, I mean offices, organizations, okay? An example would be the UN Office of uh, Human Rights. That's an example. So anything that is set up with a structure to address issues on that topic over a course of period of time, okay? Institution, organization, these are all words that you could use interchangeably. So I'll talk to you about the institutional activities of the UN climate change regime. The structures that are helping move the rules along and the structures that help to facilitate conversations, negotiations and other practice necessary for uh, continuing a program of work over a long period of time. All right. So that's a warm up to what the topic is all about. Some key points from yesterday's session, that is session one. We learned that the UN climate regime is a distinct aspect of climate change law. There are other aspects to climate change law, but one clear distinct aspect of climate change law is the United Nations climate regime. We then saw that there is a problem which currently stands at an average global temperature rise of 1.3 degree Celsius. This means it's a problem that needs addressing. It's a problem that we need to be able to rein back in. So that's something that we also uh, noticed yesterday. And this information is as of December 2023. A third key point a takeaway from session one and which leads us into session two is that climate change law and climate policies are changing state behavior and they're changing it for the better okay now that's the main reason why you should be doing this module if we think that state behavior is not being affected by climate change law then we might as well not do or study about climate change law. But we asked the question about effectiveness of climate change law and on a number of different counts, we gave different answers. One of the answers we gave was, if we did not have climate change law and climate policies, then the situation we might find ourselves in years to come is going to be even worse. So that means that states are going in the right direction. So there's the more of us who help climate change law develop more stronger, the better you can expect state behavior uh, will be towards the problem that all states are causing. So um, that gives us conviction that we need to develop uh, this area. Then fourth key point from session one, evaluating the effectiveness of climate change law can be done by asking this very specific question. Have the climate change forums 
or institutions done as well as they could politically. What are we? Just give me one second. It's asking me to. It's two of John at the same time. So. Have the climate change forums done as well as they could politically? It's just to jog your memory on what that means. All of the decisions that are taken for climate action comes from these forums. They may be temporary forums. They could be ad hoc forums. They could be uh, more continuous forums. Now, in all of these forums, the decisions are taken based on. Uh, or decisions are taken by politicians in government and other stakeholders. So it's a matter of agreeing on what we can do and the extent to which we will do or we will take a certain <clears throat> action. OK, so that's essentially one of the ways of looking at political decisions, because without political decisions, climate change policy won't get promulgated and climate change law also won't happen. Right. So we have to ask the question any time you come across an institution, how effective is that institution? Can they have done something more? OK, so that was a recap. Following on from that last key point. We're going to answer that more or look at that more deeply today. <clears throat> we start by looking at what is COP. I'll give you a introductory idea on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC Conference of Parties, COP. Then we'll look at the most latest COP, COP number 28. COP takes place every year, so you can guess now that there's been 28 COPs, so 28 years of action, 28 years of experience, 28 years of knowledge and data gathering on what the problem is and what potential solutions there might be, and also 28 years for new developments and technologies to, to be incorporated into the discussion on how we address the problem. And then we will look at the uh, decision document that comes out from COP. The latest decision document that came out was in COP28 was UAE consensus. We look at that. What are the main points in the consensus? What action can we expect in 2024 when it comes to international climate policy and climate uh, action. And then finally. We come back to where we left off yesterday. Asking this question about effectiveness, we will evaluate the UAE consensus uh, consensus. We're going to do that together. I will have an evaluation. Other commentators will have an evaluation. Each of you have to develop a voice in how you might evaluate. So then I ask you in this lecture to be actively listening, taking notes, and you know the question I'm going to ask you at the end, right? So you need to be taking notes in such a way that you can answer that question at the end of the session. All right. So with that, what is COP? The COP is an acronym and it's expanded as a conference of parties. COP or the term COP has become popular in the context of climate change. It's become now customary for media to cover the climate COP end of every year. But you should not get confused. With COP that relates to climate and COP that relates to other treaties. So the climate COP is not the only COP in town. All right. 
So you might have other cops. You might have the one that is um, of interest to those who are interested in climate cop is the cop that takes uh, place in relation to another treaty known as the Convention on Biological Diversity. They also have a conference of parties. So by now you would have guessed that if there is a treaty, then countries sign up to it are called parties and these parties meet. OK, these parties have a party and that's your cop. It's just that they have fun in a very different way. They have negotiations right through the night and that's how they have. They have fun in these parties, right? Let's hope that the fun they have in these parties are actually giving benefit for all of us to continue. Our life the way we want it to. So. I'm sorry, that's another from another meeting. So watch out COP need not only be the climate COP. The COP that we are talking about for climate is an institutional mechanism that came about via the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the foundational treaty. It is certainly a Cree treaty, but it laid the foundation for the UN climate regime. So we will be looking. Someone is not muted. Let's try and see if I can mute. Is everyone muted? All right, everyone's muted. Right. How did the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change come about? It started with this big conference. The Rio Earth Summit in the year 1992. This summit is significant in a climate regime because of what it set out to do. It provides a new blueprint for international action on the environment. Up until then, we had environmental action more localized within countries in the municipal system. OK, but this was the first time a concerted effort came about to look at the environment across the globe and hence the name Earth Summit. This has become very popular in literature. It's crossed, you know, uh, boundaries from international law into all other areas. So anyone working in environment and climate gets introduced to the Earth Summit. And rightly so. From a legal perspective and a political perspective, it led to the establishment of the UNFCCC. So the UNFCCC was negotiated during this summit. It entered into force on the 21st of March 1994. So for every country that has signed up to the UNFCC, if they signed up before the entry into force, then the provisions came into force on 21st March 1994. Any countries that joined later, the provisions apply as law for those countries as soon as they sign and ratify the convention. The main aim of UN triple, uh, FCCC is the prevention of dangerous human interference with the climate system. And this is the ultimate aim. So the underlying problem is human interference that has pushed up the average climate. Therefore, the ultimate aim of UN FCCC is also to prevent going over the boundary, OK, prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. Now recall from what I talked about yesterday, from Earth system science perspective, this is essentially breaching of a blank planetary boundary. So. Human interference that goes beyond a certain limit will breach the planetary boundary of the acceptable or 
temperature levels uh, that are considered as uh, conducive for human existence and for the workings of every other life on Earth as it does at this present point in time. So the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 led to UNFCC, which got signed and ratified by 1994. And a very large number of countries are parties to this convention. So this convention or this treaty is an instrument which has near universal participation. Okay. So in international law, when we have a treaty that is signed by almost all of the sovereign countries in the world, then you call it near universal treaty. This makes life a little bit easier for um, action to be taken because at least all of them have signed up to the treaty and agreed to the same goals and objectives. So conference of parties. What can you tell me from this particular table? Anyone, give me a shout out. Looking at the UNFCC COP, when can you expect the next COP to take place? Anyone? Is everyone there? Yes, it's Baku, probably uh, yeah. this year. This year? This year in, yeah, Baku. in Baku, Azerbaijan. In Baku, Azerbaijan this year. Excellent. How often does COP take place? Every year. Every year. It takes place okay. annually. Yeah, so it's an annual exercise. So 1994, got signed 1995 onwards. Now, why should it be an annual exercise? Well, this is the main institution that actually progresses the objectives of the treaty. So having it every year will help to look at how far we are on the road to achieving the objective. So let's look at um, Let's get a brief idea of where they've all taken place and some of the landmark ones. So the first one takes place in Germany. The second one in Switzerland. The third one in Kyoto. Does anyone know why Kyoto is famous in the climate change world? Because of the Kyoto Protocol. Because of the Kyoto Protocol. Excellent. So the Kyoto Protocol came about from COP3. All right. Then uh, Buenos Aires, back in Germany, born. Netherlands, The Hague. Morocco, then in India, then in Italy. Then in Argentina. Then in Canada, Montreal. Anyone know why Montreal COP11 is famous? Anyone has heard anything about Montreal? You can take a wild guess. It's the Montreal Protocol, OK? <laughs> we'll go into what the protocol specifically did later, but it played a key role in um, addressing the issue of the ozone layer depletion, OK? So that's Montreal. Then we had Kenya, Indonesia, Poland, Denmark, Cancun. Cancun is also quite important in uh, in the COP world or in the climate change world because um, 
the Cancun agreements got solidified in COP16. And Cancun agreements play a key role in uh, adaptation. OK, the effects of climate change and how cooperation between countries mm, can be increased in terms of knowledge, finance, technology flows, everything uh, to help adaptation efforts and to determine um, some common and concerted efforts towards adaptation. South Africa, Qatar, uh, Poland, and then in Peru, and then in uh, Paris, in France. So who can tell me why this is another landmark call? Because of the Paris Agreement. This is the Paris Agreement, yeah. So this COP, COP21 and the Paris Agreement is the one that is very relevant now. If you like, we are going through the Paris Agreement era in the climate change uh, regime. So it gave a fresh breath and a fresh impetus. Lots of new things started developing in climate change law from 2015 onwards. So for any research that you're doing in terms of climate change law, you could use 2015 as a landmark COP year. Yeah. So a year to remember. Uh, then uh, back to Morocco, back to Germany, back also to Poland, but a different place. Uh, back to Spain. And then finally, it came to the United Kingdom. Um, United Kingdom, can you see what's happening with the date there? For United Kingdom. Yeah, it's uh, uh, because of the 2020 is missing. Yeah, 2020 is missing. Any guesses why? Because of the, my thing. Because of what? Due to COVID, Professor. Yeah, because of COVID. So we were supposed to have uh, uh, United Kingdom Glasgow. So this is Glasgow in Scotland. We were going to have COP at that time, but we got pushed. But in fact, um, Italy was supposed to have it after us. And when we did have a COP in Glasgow, Italy also participated in a big way. And then Egypt. So this was the this COP was significant to me because I uh, was at uh, Sharm el Sheikh for this COP. It was um, it was one of the biggest COPs up until uh, this last COP in Dubai. So the next one is going to be in Azerbaijan. So. Um, it's not been in that region before, so it's really good to see it go into Azerbaijan. So we'll be looking forward to seeing what um, what's going on with. Is my internet connection all right? Can you hear me properly? Because I can't see that I've admitted this person. It's not. Yes, we can hear properly. Yeah, OK. Mm. OK, maybe the person is admitted. And then finally, we're going up to Brazil. In fact, we were nearly going to have a COP in Australia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, but I think they decided not to take the COP on. So um, we now have uh, are going to Azerbaijan and Brazil. This looks very much like an um, Olympic list, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Right, so gives you an idea of where all COP has taken place. Now, every time a COP goes to a certain place, there is a local influence as well. The president of that particular meeting is also by the host country, so the agenda also is um, influenced by the host country and the interests of the host country and the countries around uh, that host country or the allies of the host country. So that's a point to note. 
1997, the Kyoto Protocol is a key landmark in the UN climate regime journey. This was adopted in December. Mm. Just give me a point. There's something going on here. Right. OK. All good. So Kyoto Protocol adopted in 1997, but there was a long gap by the time the protocol was actually ratified. But currently we have 92 parties to the protocol. This particular international agreement has seen it up, uh, seen its ups and downs. We had parties to the protocol pull out of the protocol and then rejoin the protocol. So um, uh, you can now see that parties seriously think about this and take decisions. What is the thrust of this protocol? The main aim of this protocol? Industrialized countries to limit and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in accordance with agreed individual targets. So, last class, I mentioned one of the features of climate change law is differentiation. So we had four features of climate change law, the second feature of which is differentiation. What is differentiation? Differentiation is a legal principle based on how the state party or the country has acted over a period of time. So uh, over a period of time, what has changed in various countries is the levels of industrialization. So we now arrive at a point where countries can be called industrialized countries or countries that are industrializing. This particular characteristic of a country has an impact on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that they will uh, emit. So therefore, Kyoto Protocol made stratified the state parties into industrialized countries. There is no uh, definition to this term, but a stratification has been made as countries that are industrialized and countries that are not. And in technical Kyoto Protocol speak, they are basically Annex 1 countries or Annex 2 countries. So Annex 1 countries are the countries that are industrialized, right? So they have to agree on a target and they then have to execute um, policies and measures that will help them achieve that target. So that's how Kyoto Protocol worked. And I say past tense because it has come to a completion. The next big landmark was in COP21, the Paris Agreement. Now, this was adopted in December 2015, so pretty much at the end of COP21. And it entered into force on 4th of November 2016. It's just one year afterwards and rightly so. These periods of ratific adoption, ratification and entering into force are quite significant. It will give you good material for analysis and for thought. There was at least about seven, eight years gap for the Kyoto Protocol to be to come into force, and there was about 11 months of a gap in the Paris Agreement coming into force. What does that tell us about the institutional effectiveness of the UN climate regime? It's improving. State parties are getting better at understanding what each other wants. The negotiation processes are getting clearer about uh, what the goals are, how it can be achieved, and who needs to do what. So therefore, the disagreements that they might have in agreeing on a particular provision of that agreement or protocol is becoming less and less, right? But we can also assess it in another way, saying, are we actually 
upping the ante? Are we asking for more to be done? Is the ambition becoming less or what? So that's another way of asking whether, uh, I mean, assessing the speed at which any instruments being adopted are coming into force. OK, but you will shortly see that Paris Agreement is not anything short of, um, you know, a, a high ambition. And we already noted that it's only because of these policies that our temperature is not going to go up to four degrees, but it's going to be kept at 2.7. And we are hoping that we can knock that down as well. The policy effectiveness can become better. So we actually achieve the 1.5 target by the year 2050. So the mainstay of the Paris Agreement is it initiated the process of a global stock take. So the global stock take now will take, take place every year, meaning we will be looking at where we are year on year. Now, nationally, this may be done or it may not be done, depending on every country. But at an international level, we have agreed that we need to have a much closer understanding of the real time evolution of the situation of global warming. Therefore, we will do a global stock take. And it has also initiated the NDC process. NDC is nationally determined contributions for the reduction of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So I said Kyoto Protocol has now wound up. This idea of some countries laying out targets for emissions is now being replaced by all countries who are parties, who are state parties to the Paris Agreement, to the UNFCC, there, you know, consequentially, have to uh, have targets. So the nationally determined contribution, most countries do have a target. So for example, the United Kingdom is saying we will achieve net zero by 2050. Okay. Now China then came out uh, and announced that they would come to net zero by 2060. Now, I don't know about Russia. Has Russia made a statement on when they would reach 20, uh, sorry, net zero? Does anybody know? OK, something for you to find out. So the nationally determined contribution. Asks every state party. To lay out a plan to submit a plan. Now there is a legal principle involved in the submission of NDC. That legal principle is that the policies and plans submitted as part of the nationally determined contribution has to always keep pushing up the ambition to reduce emissions. This is called the ratchet principle. Now what is the ratchet principle? The tool, there's a tool known as a ratchet. You can ratchet up, meaning you can you can keep going up, but if you want to come in reverse, it won't be possible. Okay, a ratchet essentially has that function. You can keep winding it up and it'll keep going forward, but it'll stop you from going backwards. So you might think, well, that's you know, okay, how good is that gonna be? We have to keep increasing. But you will be ah, Russia by 2060 as well. Well, very good. So you might be. Um, you might be thinking, well, you know, it's not it's not a great principle, but the reason why we need to have that principle is because of the complexity of the problem and also because of all the uncertainties that surround global economic development, global progress, etc. Because number of factors feed into, let's say, our energy transition as one example. And it might lead to a regression. Okay, 
Year on year, we are increasing. Then we try to reduce. And if there is another factor that comes in from the left field, suddenly your emissions might increase. So the ratchet principle helps try to prevent that. Okay, you have to anticipate. Uh, general principles of international law can kick in. So we can apply the rules around state responsibility to say if you have undertaken an international obligation, if you have gone in breach of the international obligation, then according to the rules of state responsibility, you have to be able to take action to reverse that and to compensate. OK, now that's a separate discussion to be had. But the key to remember is the NDC is a voluntarily decided um, contribution by every state party to the Paris Agreement and also the principle of always pushing the ambition up and not going back downwards applies in framing the NDC. The key article. This is the if there is one legal principle that is a symbol of the United Nations climate regime, that is Article 2, subsection A, subsection A, subsection 1A. What is it saying? This is a verbatim reproduction of Article 2, 1A. The state parties commit to holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. OK, so this statement this phraseology is something you should use in your writing when you refer to what is the objective of climate change law. OK, this is the prime objective of climate change law. All of these phrases over here you're familiar with from yesterday. So global average temperature. And then the figure of two degrees Celsius, the figure of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So. You might ask, why do you have two degrees? Why do you have 1.5 degrees? Why can't it just be one clear um, figure? Yes, it's a good question. But as negotiations go and as um, legal provisions follow negotiations, you will always have this level of um, wording. Sometimes it's very categorical and clear. Sometimes the negotiation process leads to provisions like this. But this was in 2015. But by now, we do clearly look at 1.5 degree Celsius as the aim that we should go for. There is a bit of controversy around this. You might have a few views here and there, but we're pretty much now holding more on to 1.5 degree, although it looks like a number of uh, state policies will not help us achieve 1.5. So all the more reason why we need to push it further so that in case there is slippage, it's not slippage from two, but it's only slippage from 1.5. We can have another argument, a completely different argument from what is the safe operating? What is the planetary boundary for climate change? And then assess Article 1, 21A's ambition of 2 degree and 1.5 from that perspective as well. So. Right, so we come now to. Having had a background of COP, we come to the point of looking at the latest COP. That's COP 28 in Dubai. And here's a summary for you. So you can get an idea of the people involved, the period over which it takes place, and also the nature of um, leadership that participates in uh, COP meetings. COP28 ran for 14 days. A total of 83,884 people attended in person, another 2,000 plus, were online. 
And COP28 was definitely the uh, largest climate COP since COPs first began in 1995. So Sharm el-Sheikh had 35,000 lesser than what we had. So this must have been quite a humongous conference. How does it compare to other sort of events that you know of? What about the final of Olympics? What about a, a, a football match, a final of a big football match? Give me an idea of what's the biggest event you have known about. What's the biggest event that takes place in Russia? I think the cricket match between India and Pakistan is also having a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. I think uh, the last World Cup final was 120,000. Mm. 120,000 or was it only 100? No, I think it was more than that. Yeah, it was more than that. More than that. More than that. And if you include the online, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what do you think? We should just have a cop session at the end or the back of a World Cup final. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. We did see that uh, India is a huge emitter. It's, you know, 7% of world emissions take place there. Maybe the way to do it is if we don't have a cricket match, a world final, then we might reduce emissions. <laughs> <laughs> and online, yeah, a lot of people are, are watching online as well. A lot of people watching online as well. That mm. also, you know, increases emissions. Did you know mm -hmm. something that um, the, you know, the industry that has contributed to emissions at the fastest rate is online activity? Because if we look at, uh, you know, when industrialization first began, 1750 onwards, right? So the discovery of uh, reserves of coal and other combustible in large, um, and then the uh, internal combustion engine was invented and we married the two together. And, um, you know, this age of steam started and then the age of, so that progress. So that was what led to the industrial. So if you look at from 1750 onwards, what sort of industries have come um, and developed over a period of time and how they have contributed to emissions of all the industries, in the last 20 years, no, in the last 30 years, the development of the computer industry or the interconnectedness of computers, so internet era onwards, has been the industry that has uh, uh, contributed the fastest to all the emissions. So what they're saying is the internet industry in the last 30 years has produced the same amount of emissions as the last 250 years. Yeah, that's alarming. That's a lot. Can you guess what contributes to this? Why is, you know, activity so the internet and everything related to the internet emitting so much? Maybe because of the energy that they require for this connectivity. Energy? OK, your laptop doesn't require that much energy. Your washing machine requires more energy. Your dryer requires more energy. Your laptop actually takes only very less energy. What else takes up a lot of energy in the, yeah, Siddharth? Uh, Ma'am, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, I think uh, majority of the times for this electronic products, there are semiconductors or some uh, products required <laughs> which conduct uh, those things and they, mm -hmm. they require mining processes in different uh, third world countries. So mm. all these processes indirectly may result into pollution, even though that device is not causing, but the overall mm -hmm. production facility of it can indirectly cause 
Yeah, agreed. The hardware that is required to keep all our, you know, us connected like this definitely costs lots of emissions as well. So it is also high in emission, but that is still not the highest in the internet uh, connectivity world. Any other guesses? So the highest amount of emissions actually comes from data itself. Because you need to store the data somewhere. All of this stuff that you and I are doing, OK, what I'm recording now is being recorded on a cloud. Now this cloud is what causes a lot of emissions. So you may have heard, heard of data centers. So data centers are the one which hold all the data that we are producing using our laptops. OK, now to hold all the data, all your photographs, all you know, your coursework, everything that you do, it needs to be stored somewhere. It needs to be held. We need to be able to use it in real time for transactions, recall it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these take a lot of energy. In fact, this is the one that takes a lot more because you might have one laptop, but then the amount of data you create on it is immense, right? So if you just multiply that according to how many laptops there are and how many people there are. So then you can see the enormity of how much. Um, there are two resources that are, um, you know, taken up by uh, data centers. One is they use up a lot of water because a lot of cooling is required for having all these data centers. And there is a lot of innovation going on around uh, data centers. So you have, I think Google has some data centers in the middle of the ocean. So where you have no shortage of water. But then you need people to work in data centers. You can't keep going from your house to the ocean and start working in data centers. So you need to have data centers in, uh, you know, in and around cities where people can go and work in it. So that takes up local water supply. The local energy supplies also is being eaten up by data centers. So a huge amount of um, emissions does come from, you know, data centers. Uh, anyway, we've gone off on, 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 on a direction of exploration. So let's come back to this. We uh, so the largest um, largest COP, COP28. So let's see what happens in Baku, uh, whether they can uh, beat Dubai. Uh, but Dubai had, um, has excellent facilities for uh, hosting large events, so they were able to accommodate. Uh, we did struggle in Sharm el Sheikh because although it has quite a bit of venue capacity. It's not the same like Dubai, which is used to big conventions. I don't have any idea about Baku in terms of how it might be able to cope uh, with delegates, because that's also um, a matter for consideration when we have COP usually. Uh, one area of contention has been the uh, involvement of um, uh, delegates or uh, professionals connected to coal, oil and gas in the national negotiating delegations that attend COP. So uh, since about Glasgow, I think um, there have been reports on the composition of delegations um, with interests connected to the fossil fuel industry. So it's been reported that in COP28, there were approximately 2,500 delegates that were connected to oil, gas and coal. Well, on the one hand, it could be interpreted as saying we need professionals from the industry to be able to spend their time on in meetings like COP so they can understand uh, what it is that they need to do, what steps need to take in order to pull back or face down from fossil fuel. But another perspective is that mm, the influence could be quite negative. It could be in reducing the ambition of COP if the interests of coal, oil and gas sectors are pushed forward. So I leave it to your thinking as to what conclusions you might draw from the participation of interests close to coal, oil and gas industry uh, playing a role in COP. 198 parties, all of them present and participating. 
that includes 197 countries and then the European Union has its own uh, membership uh, to the uh, uh, to the Paris Agreement. 167 world leaders. King Charles, um, our very own monarch from the United Kingdom and Pope Francis. So um, both of these leaders are quite different to uh, heads of state, but we also had notably uh, the heads of states of the United Kingdom. So we had Sunak, Modi, Schultz, Macron, Putin. So quite a large cross section of the high emitting nations. Notable by their absence were Biden not being present and Xi Jinping not present either. Um, at the end of COP28, we had the consensus document. It's a 21 page outcome. I urge you to go have a look and read uh, the document. But well, let's briefly discuss what the uh, key points of outcome were. So that gives you a roadmap or a milestone uh, markers for understanding the 21 page document when you read it yourself. So this 21 page document is known as the UAE consensus. And it's actually exactly that. All of them agree, all of the parties at the UAE COP agree that these particular uh, objectives need to be pushed forward. For the very first time, Fossil fuels were identified as a major factor for emission and therefore the objective of transitioning from fossil fuels was agreed on. Well, there is a debate on whether the language has uh, should have been much stronger than transition away because you could think of what other options you could have. You could say stop using fossil fuel. OK, transition from fossil fuel. Do these two things mean the same? It's a question no, that you need to debate. Sorry? No, they're, they're, they are quite different. Like the language, quite the, different. Transi yeah, the transition is like a very mild and very soft language being used. And it it's definitely not, and, soft. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely soft, but we do need to have a transition as well, right? We can't like literally stop. But yes, we could actually say stop at this point and then uh, you know agree on a clear date. That's not not there really. So it's definitely uh, could have been improved. Well, we'll see what um, you know negotiators were trying to do and what their opinions was in a bit. So transition away from fossil fuel, fossil fuels, loss and damage fund. Now this is a big win in uh, Dubai. Everyone was surprised when I think on day two of the COP, uh, COP28 itself, they had come to this agreement and for the first time, a loss and damage fund was established. Now, this is a terminology that I should give you a little bit of background on. So, firstly, you will have adaptation. Okay, what is adaptation? You're looking at you can foresee the consequence of a temperature rise in a certain place, and then you take measures to adapt. But once you take those measures, there is still no guarantee that the impact of the a particular climate risk won't materialize. And if it does materialize, then what happens? The risk becomes a disaster, and the disaster leads to loss and damage. That could be lives, that could be livelihoods, that could be environment, and that could be probably even that a big section of the Earth system. OK, so the concept of loss and damage is. Um, has gathered a lot of steam in recent years. It was not a focus in 1994, when the first COP started. When the first COP started, mitigation was really the focus. Then 
as we have gone along, adaptation became focus. And the once the wildfires around the world, the floods around the world, the droughts around the world, all of these climate risks started um, appearing as disasters. And once the linkage has been made from the flood to uh, climate change or global warming, then the question of loss and damage became more and more prominent. And so now for the first time, uh, a fund, so a pot of money has been created. The details of which we have to work out this year, right? 2024. So this is another thing to look out for. So the first thing to look out for from COP28 into 2024 is how is this promise of transition from fossil fuel panning out? Are we going to have, what is the nature of the commitment on transition from fossil fuel going to be reflected in the national determined contributions, as well as in any other national policies that come out which relate to the NDC? The third uh, push is with mitigation, and that is with increasing renewables capacity. This, uh, like I said, has been the focus right from the start of COP, and now it has reached advanced stages of uh, increasing capacity of renewables. Renewables is quite a success story because the um, uh, capacity of energy that can be produced through renewable energy sources has um, increased manifold since we first started. This tech, the it's not one or a specific technology I'm talking about. It's a whole raft of technologies. Um, some of the uh, more widely deployed renewable technology, like solar, wind energy, um, uh, wind farms. So these have multiplied and they have come very much into uh, consumer use for quite a while now. And we are beginning to understand the economics of that a lot more as well. There are other more innovative sources of renewable energy because we do need a diversity of renewable energy methods uh, so that we can deploy renewable energy in any part of the world, in any circumstance suitable for any type of um, a geography, uh, a, a socioeconomic um, uh, functioning system, etc. So we do need uh, more diversity of a renewable technology as well. So all of that is being pushed forward by the UAE consensus in many ways. Then uh, food system. This was an item that appeared in the UAE consensus. And for the first time, um, food system is being looked at in UNFCC COPS. OK. Uh, we know the. Uh, warming climate, the uh, droughts and the un unequal impact of them in different places is causing a problem. But this is the first time it's been looked at as part of um, uh, UNFC Triple C COP. Now, food system is very important. Um, there's uh, of late, there's a lot of discussion around food. Uh, so. Can I get an idea from any of you guys? What is the crisis in uh, the food systems now? What have you heard about in the news? What do you know about from reading elsewhere? Anyone? What's your favorite food? If any of you are having dinner under the table, what kind of food are you having? I think uh, uh, regarding to the climate change, uh, this food system uh, means like uh, the crop uh, failure and the uh, yields that has been reduced and disruption in the food supply chains. Yeah. Crop so failure. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, go on. I, I think like from the climate change and the global warming, the condition, uh, these uh, basically uh, impact the 
availability of the water resources for agriculture and affecting mm-hmm. the irrigation and uh, water management system and the rising temperature temperature also uh, affect the nutritional content of the certain crops mm. yeah that too that's an important point and the third point is that food cultivation also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions mm. yeah so that is also another point yeah both so droughts affect food production then floods also affect food production and has has all of this now had an impact on everyday lives of people yeah i think uh, uh, this uh, all of these complicate the uh, glo- global food security system and the insecurity of the underdeveloped nation where the flooding and the droughts is, is very much high uh, due to uh, these uh, uh, factors so uh, mm-hmm. so the, the the agriculture and the irrigation and the food security system has been affected mm 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 correct siddharth you want to add uh ma'am uh, i would like sure. to add one point uh, that even not even in the modern times but since we have discovered agriculture we have caused deforestation for getting more land and uh, at the same time in the modern times due to excessive use of pesticides fertilizers uh, this, there is this problem of soil erosion also which mm. uh, is also creating problems with water holding capacity of the soil and then mm. due to also um, we can say with food but at the same mm. time uh, because uh, the soil is not able to hold water we are also seeing excessive floods in the uh, city areas or something mm. like that so it's uh, all these things are happening because our agricultural practices are not sustainable and that i think uh, um, mm-hmm. is related to food production in not being done in a sustainable way yeah it's a long standing sustainability problem not just a climate change problem yeah that is a that means it's compounded by climate change isn't it first of all we were not having sustainable food production and then now it's compounded by climate change i agree good thinking that uh, someone else put their hands up was that was that jones i remember right um yeah correct can you hear me yeah. professor yeah i can um Uh, all right okay so sidhat has basically said everything um um mm. regarding mm. how um mm-hmm. food production has been affected by mm. um some of these things um mm. i'd also like to talk about how um this has affected the cost of um, food you know leading to serious mm. um food insecurity for instance in my in my country nigeria um i'm i'm very much aware that uh flood which mm. is um, an after effect of some of these um <clears throat> some of the consequences of um, climate change as as this trade mm-hmm. over 569000 hectares of 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 um you know agricultural land and and this has mm-hmm. of course led to intense food um insecurity which has increased the costs of of um and and the prices of food so in so many ways i think all these are really interconnected and um this is due to what is happening at the moment yeah thank you that's the last point i wanted to make is food prices you can see the difference already can't you everything is costing more especially food so one example that was given um in the context of rising food price was the staple foods so grains rice which is consumed by about 4 billion people around the world but mainly in asia there are many countries which have uh, rice as a staple food that has seen a huge rise in food prices so in philippines um earlier this year the food inflation sorry rice inflation was 33% the general inflation was 2.8% food inflation uh, rice inflation in thailand 
was about 15%. The general inflation was again 2%. So there is a huge gap between the general inflation and the staple food. Because we can now start looking at food from the staple perspective and then other types of food. It becomes quite serious once the staple gets affected. And rice is one good example. Why is rice a very good example? One reason I've already given you is because of the large numbers of people who consume rice as staple. Uh, the other reason is also because rice is both a contributor to climate change. Um, I mean, agricultural practices contribute to climate change. But even within agricultural practices, if you break it down, rice is one of the large contributors. So agricultural practices, to give you an example of how greenhouse gases are emitted, you have a rice that grows in, um, uh, rice requires a lot of water. So most of the times paddy fields or rice fields are flooded with water. And the way in which the, um, and that works is it leads also to the formation of methane as opposed to CO2 because of the way in which uh, paddy is uh, grown and cultivated. And CO2 has 80 times the capacity of warming the atmosphere in the same amount of time as the same amount of CO2 will warm the atmosphere. So now you have a problem that some of the agriculture practices and particularly examples such as rice contribute to, but at the same time are also being affected by climate change. Now, what is the solution for this? Two things. One is you have to pursue mitigation more seriously. Second, you have to try and make sure that the um, waste that happens from food is also reduced, okay? So multiple ways in which you can address it. And the question is, when we talk about climate change law, how far does it extend, yeah? So at the beginning, when we looked at what is climate change law, we said it's not a discrete area of law. A distinctive component of it is climate change law, the UN climate regime. But climate change law is made up of public international law, environmental law, trade law, human rights law, migration law. Now we're talking about trade law. So question to explore would be, how will trade rules operate in the context of food shortages? How are countries reacting or behaving in the context of food shortages and their duty to be able to uh, keep the trade free and open. Yeah. Now, all of those countries that are members of the Paris Agreement are also members of the World Trade Organization, not country, country to country in exact same numbers, but majority of the countries are, or a very large number of significant countries are those that emit and those that trade are very much overlapping, okay? So you have, uh, so one, one reaction to food shortage will be, a country will then start saying import, uh, sorry, export restrictions on a particular food stuff, or uh, in fact, export restrictions on rice has already been um, Im uh, imposed by India last year. And the reason being, there is not enough for internal consumption. Now, what is the rule of in trade law? Export restrictions will be monitored. It should be laid out equitably. There need to be justifiable reasons for it. So as we go, go into the future, we are going to see different rules from different regimes clashing as well. In order to satisfy an obligation under the climate treaty, you might come uh, to loggerheads with a obligation you uh, country has under another international treaty. Yeah. So coming back to the point about UAE consensus, 
uh, we can see now that food systems needs to be managed. It needs to come more centrally into climate negotiations, and that's what's happened in um, in COP28. So in 2024, expect to see um, items around food systems or regulatory and policy items around food systems management in the context of climate change. So you have both transforming food systems, but also addressing how uh, adaptation in food systems can be done better. Biodiversity. Biodiversity is, um, what is the function of biodiversity in climate change? Can anyone give me an idea about what is the place of biodiversity in climate change? What is biodiversity? Yeah, so that. Uh, um, biodiversity may refer to also this food chain between the animals and uh, in a way how a particular animal is placed by the nature there to uh, what you say control the overpopulation of another species so like let's say if lions diminish to an extensive extent then deers may increase or uh, and then the deers may extensively eat grass again leading to what you say soil erosion so the mm -hmm. issue is that this chain is created by nature in a way to maintain a balance but then human activities like excessive industrialization or deforestation completely destroys this habitat and creates problem for that ecosystem, which was very nice, like a proper balance of oxygen, which was mm -hmm. able to create a suitable environment for humans some centuries ago. But now as uh, these problems we are doing, like excessive agriculture or excessive emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, so mm -hmm. we are uh, creating problems like let's say some species are now at the verge of extinction and some have been extinct so now we have to work upon preserving those species to a particular extent that we do not disturb the entire food chain so i think biodiversity also refers to maintenance of that balance in the mm -hmm. environment in a way so that we can also be protected otherwise we will also suffer many damages because of it mm -hmm. that's quite yeah. eloquent so I can see where you're coming from. You're talking about maintaining of the diversity, right? Um, there's another term which is more suitable to what you described, and that's conservation. Yeah. So if you want to conserve uh, yeah, a particular yes, yeah. species, then you have to look at how the balance of, you know, so the balance of deer mm. and uh, trees in a forest. So you do need to cull deer, you know, as much as we don't like to uh, kill animals, you do have to cull deer, and that's a part of the conservation efforts. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. So that is the systemic challenges you have within the natural environment itself. In the same vein, what we do need to um, do is how is uh, the diversity between the human species and the rest of the life, how is that going to benefit environment? Now, as an individual human being, forget our consumption, OK? Forget consumption. Uh, you know, we build houses, we buy cars, we have furniture, we buy laptops. That's consumption. Forget that. But for human sustenance, a human being, do we cause any emissions? Yes, uh, like um, uh, carbon, carbon dioxide, this is. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. So each of us are breathing out carbon dioxide. So we are mm. emitters by ourselves. Mm. Yeah. But it's unavoidable, right? We breathe yeah. out CO2. That's unavoidable. OK, so as a species in the framework of life, we contribute to emission. Uh, but what about uh, flora? What about trees? Do they contribute to emission? Uh, 
they 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 help to mitigate the let's see consequences of the greenhouse is uh, gases <clears throat> exactly so what do they do they absorb carbon dioxide and they let out oxygen right so now here is the role of uh, biodiversity which is roughly considered as you can think of them as forests as green cover okay so natural Actually, carbon sinks uh, yeah go on trees also consume uh, oxygen so they of course emit oxygen but only at daytime and so for example if daytime is very little then trees may consume even more than they like emit Mm -hmm. So they emit the right type of gases, right? So they don't emit greenhouse gases, only human beings. We emit one type of greenhouse gas, correct? So now we can use this. We can use forests. We can use trees as carbon sinks, meaning they can actually absorb it and hold it. And in fact, that's exactly what uh, petroleum is about, crude. So what is crude oil? It's lots and lots of trees and other types of plants and um, uh, animal remains that have over millennia accumulated under high pressure, gone underground, and they have become, they have trapped all of the energy. And that's what happens. We take them out. They have become fossilized. If we take them out, and if we start using them, we are releasing all of that carbon dioxide that they helped to hold back. Yeah, it's just that it's a difference in time. Currently, trees just hold it, but trees from so many years ago and other things from so many years ago, organic material from years ago, have all become compressed. And that's how they have so much power and energy that then we can put into our cars and, you know, other engines which use up such energy. So biodiversity, increasing biodiversity, increasing green cover is, um, so this is not a speciality from uh, 28, 20, uh, 28 COP. Um, it, we agreed even in uh, the Sharm COP, we said 30 for 30. Yeah, so by 2030, 30% 30 of the world's land should be covered with green cover. Yeah, and green is a very good color for addressing climate change because most green things actually absorb carbon dioxide, right? So using that um, symbol of green or green cover um, helps us understand how we can promote and extend carbon sinks. So there is a huge amount of emphasis on doing that. Um, it has other uh, benefits too, uh, some of which uh, have already been alluded in terms of the conservation and how it helps food chain and how it helps um, uh, the, uh, how it has uh, collateral benefits as well. So biodiversity has is featured again in uh, the consensus and we can expect that biodiversity and the protection of biodiversity, uh, very specific and deep actions and in particular places, right? And uh, the types of biodiversity we protect are also quite important. Um, we need to make sure that they are protected from the effects of climate change too, because what did we see uh, happen when we had forest fires? It is forest fires. So not only did uh, the forest fires affect um, uh, you know, the human habitations nearby, it made it unsafe. Uh, it was uh, the air was uh, uh, causing a lot of health hazards. It also destroyed the carbon sinks. So the forests which were holding back carbon, that was destroyed as well. So that means climate change has an impact. If we use forests as carbon sink, if we use green cover as uh, carbon sinks, then we also need to make sure adaptation measures for them are also strong. Otherwise, we might think we are developing carbon sink, but come a flood or uh, any kind of a heat wave, you might see them destroyed. So using biodiversity as a mitigation uh, tool, 
becomes quite important. Um, uh, planning becomes very important in that context. So all of this is the sort of decisions and efforts that we will uh, keep seeing over uh, COPs, and that was evident in this COP as well. Then other uh, topics that were pushed forward to carbon capture and storage. So we have come to the idea that it's not enough now just to stop emissions. We need to actively remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it away. So forests act as natural carbon sinks, but there's other means, technological means of capturing carbon directly from the air or capturing carbon at source. So let's say at the end of a um, uh, emission pipe in a car, if we are able to capture before it goes out into the uh, atmosphere, you can capture that and um, make sure it doesn't enter the atmosphere. So other kinds of like industrial activity also lead to carbon dioxide emission and at source you're able to capture and bring it back. So there's multiple technologies, but then they're quite expensive and they are not being scaled up at the level that we need it to, at the speed that we need to address the problem. So the UAE consensus also quite controversially addressed this. Um, a, one of the reasons why uh, we saw uh, a number of delegates from coal or coal oil and gas sector was to consider how carbon capture and storage is an option that can be built into their policies. So if you get a license to explore an oil field and to exploit um, an oil field, then there will be certain conditions attached to uh, 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 you for the operations to also provide for carbon capture and storage. So what kind of different mechanisms can be enforced to increase um, capturing of carbon from the atmosphere? Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. There is a separate declaration that was uh, in COP27, uh, reduction of methane. So that was followed through in the COP28 consensus as well. And then the global stock take, the race to zero update, another key part. We need to know accurately how we are moving forward. OK, um, can someone give me the time? When I use these slides, I can't see the time. Is it time for a break? I think it's time for the break. <laughs> OK, if you say so. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's take a break right now and then come back in 10 minutes time. All right. Thank, thank you. All right. See you guys in a bit.
time to get back. Okay, let's say hello to some of you on the call today. Who's coming on camera? Hello. Hi. How are you? You're you. Kate, like aren't you? You're Kate, right? Yes. Hello, Kate. Um, Anna, yes, I saw you two yesterday. Pankaj, nice. How's it going today? Good, Professor. Did you guys have a busy day? No, no. Not a busy day? Professor. I thought students had a busy day every day. It professor depend upon the use of uh, use of our time. Yeah, how many How days do you have class? I think professor in a week two class two days only two on days. Tuesday and Friday. Yeah. Professor. Okay. So other days, how many days do you use for your preparation and other things like writing, reading? No, professor, we actually we have to write master thesis. That's why we are engaged on the remaining days. Okay. So are you also like uh, my UK students where half of the time everyone is working? So do you guys also work? Wow. Okay. Well, How many hours do you guys work? Like... Uh, Every day or every week, how many hours? Most of the times, I work from morning to evening. My classes are from six to nine, and the mm -hmm. days that I have classes in the afternoon, how good is online, so I can join online while I work. Yeah, right. What kind of jobs are available for students in Moscow? Um, all kinds. <laughs> all right. Yeah. No any restrictions or limitations for students. You can just work everywhere. Yeah. You should be able to speak the language. So for ah, those of us who yes. language, you only do teaching in English and maybe working in the kitchen. Okay. okay. Teaching and kitchen both are <laughs> strenuous. <laughs> It takes up energy, doesn't it? Well, what else do you guys work? Supermarkets? I'm working at the court, intellectual property court. OK. Is it interesting? Yeah, I'm a consultant, so we form the practice for all the arbitration courts. Oh, that, right, OK. Uh, us. So then you actually have two workloads, your code workload and this workload. How do you get some exercise? Because that sounds like a desk job as well, right? But that sounds interesting. Good. Well, then uh, I think you have to have a lot of um, good management of how you do things when you know part of studying this module is you have to gather knowledge but you also have to do a lot of thinking and reflection you know on solutions so um 
maybe when you're doing your other job, um, if it is not something where you're thinking a lot, then you can think and reflect on how to find solutions for some of the you know, tough problems we have. So you have to juggle your week, I think, if you're going to do work on this module and do your other stuff as well. Right, okay, so let's go into the rest of this lecture. And at the end of it, I am going to be releasing your uh, assignment question. Okay, so um, hang in there for that. <clears throat> right, so before the break, we were looking at the document that came out in COP28. In the next few slides, I am going to take you through. Oh, right, yeah. Take you through the um, observations that were made afterwards. The question is, could the UAE consensus have been more ambitious? Could the negotiators have done better? All right. So we'll see from, listen from different people. These are all the people who have been involved in the negotiations uh, in the run up to the UAE consensus, and uh, some of them may have been observers and contributors, but not necessarily decision makers. The first view, EU's chief negotiator, Vopke Hoekstra. They said the main outcome from COP28 was truly consequential and the beginning of the end of fossil fuels. So as you read the comments, from the negotiators, you should also start forming a picture of what seemed to be the key issues in COP28. Next, Annie Rasmussen, representing the Alliance of Small Island States. She said, in terms of safeguarding 1.5 degrees Celsius in a meaningful way, the language is certainly a step forward. It speaks to transitioning away from fossil fuels in a way the process has not done before, but we must note the text does not speak specifically to fossil fuel phase out and mitigation in a way that is in fact the step change that is needed. It is incremental and not transformational. We see a litany of loopholes in this text that are a major concern to us. Okay. So you need to note the points made here. It's definitely better than what it was before, but what is needed, it's a small step for what is needed. It's an incremental step to say that we will face out or transition away from fossil fuels, but what we need is a transformation, not just increment. And then, a litany of loopholes in this text that are a major concern to us. So make note of that. Make a mental note or a physical note that there are loopholes. What might you be referring to as loophole? So when you read the 21 page outcome, you have to look for what is the loopholes being referred to. So that's the small island states view. Then the Indian Minister for Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Bhupendra Yadav said in a statement, India urges that the determination shown at COP is also substantiated with means to bring it to fruition. This must be based on the principles of equity and climate justice, which is respectful of national circumstances and where the developed countries can take the lead based on their historical contributions. Right. So now you see the emphasis being made on principles of equity and climate justice. So a different tone. And there is um, some points being made are being alluded to in a slightly different perspective. OK, so we can discuss to see what this means. We can look at what the Indian minister said and then what the small island states representative said. Yeah, 
Do you think they will be in the opposite side of the negotiating table? Are they on the same side? Do they want the same thing in the same way? We all are agreed we want the same thing, but the question is in what way do we do it? So if you remember the approaches to climate policy, you could approach it purely as an environmental perspective and say that the environmental priority is our priority. Or you could say the economic priorities cannot be disregarded and that's our priority, even though it comes a little bit over environment. And then the third one is we don't really care about anything. Look, this is again another injustice being perpetrated on us. So we first need to look at justice issues. So those were the three approaches we said climate policy takes up. So we need to look at the UAE consensus and ask which provision is being underlined by which approach. And that's already coming out in the views of the negotiators around the table. Then US climate envoy John Kerry. First, the document highlights that we have to adhere to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius within reach. That is the North Star. Yeah, so that is our guiding figure. We therefore must do these things necessary to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius, everything we can to achieve this goal. A lot of words there. In particular, it states that our next climate, uh, national climate plans, which is the nationally determined contributions, will be aligned with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. I think everyone has to agree this is much stronger and clearer as a call on 1.5 than we have ever heard before. So Kerry's reference is directly to the wording of Article 21A. So if you remember in Article 21A, they said we'll do two degrees, but ideally we should do 1.5. But what Kerry is saying in this is it very clearly we're aiming for 1.5. This is the clearer, clearest and the strongest message we have got from an international consensus that we should aim only for a 1.5 degree rise in temperature. So quite notable in the development of the target. Moving on. Madeleine Dufsa, head of climate change at the Ministry of Environment of Senegal and chair of the least developed countries group. OK, so another stakeholder. This outcome is not perfect. We expected more. It reflects the very lowest possible ambition that we could accept rather than what we know, according to the best available science, is necessary to urgently address the climate crisis. She must be a lawyer. She's writing a very long convoluted sentence. Yeah. Next year will be critical in deciding the new climate finance goal, which must be informed by this global stock take and must close the vast gaps that have been identified. To respond to the global stock take, the new goal must reflect the full needs of our countries to address climate change, including the costs to mitigate, to adapt and to address loss and damage. So more themes coming out of this statement. So you need to look back to see what happened in COP28 on these themes. So she clearly mentions the costs to mitigate, the costs to adapt, the costs to address loss and damage. So least developed countries are not only looking for support and cooperation for loss and damage, but also for adaptation, also for mitigation. Yeah. And she's also pointing out that 2024 is going to be important for deciding the climate finance goal. So least developed countries are looking for finance for all aspects of their climate action. That means the climate finance goal needs to be set in a way that can help and provide for all the least developed countries. OK, so we need to have a finance uh, figure that is commensurate with the needs of the least developed countries to address all these three aspects. Then the Colombian minister, Susana Mohammed, told the plenary loopholes in the final te text have risks and the risks and undermine the political will. 
OK, so the consensus has gaps. So it might not necessarily be consensus. Or rather, if the loopholes are how they tidied over some of the disagreements. So therefore, if the loophole, if the risks in the loopholes materialize, then the political will and the consensus will break, and which is not very good for climate action globally. The transition fuels could end up colonizing the space of decarbonization. Very interesting statement. What is the transition fuel? Yeah, natural gas. Transition fuel could end up colonizing the space of decarbonization. So what it means is when you say renewable and when you say transitioning, you might not think of natural gas as part of that deal, but it might be that all that the fossil fuel sector is willing to give up is coal and maybe and oil, but they might want to keep uh, natural gas and natural gas might actually fill up the whole space of decarbonization. Whereas the aim is to try and go to renewables. OK, renewables. And fossil fuels, two different things. So that is one of the loopholes being identified. By saying if we are transitioning away, what uh, role has the transition fuel got to play? In it. Right now, in the financial segment of the text, we don't have still the economic structure required for this deep transition, which is not only an energy transition, but is fundamentally a whole of society economic transition. A very important point here. So we are saying we're transitioning, but where is the economic structure? Now, what do we mean by economic structure? Subsidies is an example of economic structure. OK, so government support, financial support for propping up certain industries and sectors. That policy has to uh, follow transitioning. If that economic structure of subsidies is still with fossil fuels, then uh, this transitioning is not going to be realistic. And then beyond that, they are looking at a whole of society economic transition, meaning how do someone wants to join, is it? Just give me one second. Yeah. So we transition away from fossil fuels. What about it's not just the cars, it's also how we heat, heat our homes and um, we have boilers, for example, uh, to heat our homes. But if and boilers work on using fossil fuels, uh, so then we need to have uh, other technologies coming in. Let's say we put solar panels on the roof. But what about the grid infrastructure for that? What about the storage facilities for whatever energy is produced in the solar panel. We know at the moment the technology for that means you need to have a large space to store that. So even if you remove a boiler and put a solar panel, are you going to have enough space in a house, for example, to do that? How big should your house be? If you have heat pumps, that's another technology. The heat pump is really, really noisy. Then what happens to the structure of you know, your windows and stuff? If you have your window next to your heat pump, how do we need to design a ground floor of a house? Do we need to change that? So basically a whole of society economic transition also is what we are trying to look at. Then there is the big question of energy security. Currently, what happened during um, the last two, three years? We've had uh, a huge issue in supply. Um, and what happened? Many countries actually reverted back to fossil fuels because we couldn't get the, the there was disruption in the supply chain because of global events that were taking place. So uh, we are, you know, we can talk about transition, but how ready are we to actually accept the risks and costs that come with it? Um, and we need the economic structure to be put in place. So all of that is being referred to over here. Next, the Bolivian chief negotiator Diego 
uh, Pacheco told the plenary, we cannot support outcomes that mean that the world will enter a new era of implementation of the Paris Agreement without equity, without common but differentiated responsibilities, without a differentiation between developed and developing countries, and without means of implementing implementation and concrete financing for developing countries. So the Bolivian chief negotiator is um, very worried that the fundamental principle in climate change law, which is differentiation, seems to be not implemented in the era of the Paris Agreement. So the Kyoto Protocol very clearly made a categorical distinction. So yesterday I said Paris Agreement is more tailored and nuanced, whereas the Kyoto Protocol is more categorical. It's categorical because there's a clear division between industrialized countries and Annex 1 of that treaty and non-industrialized countries. So non-Annex 1 treaty countries, whereas Paris Agreement gets rid of that sort of a differentiation. However, it gives uh, a responsibility on all countries okay, to uh, determine what kind of contribution they're going to make for emissions reduction. So there is a concern here about uh, climate justice and equity. Developed countries have not decided to take the initiative of leading the fight against climate crisis, and this is jeopardizing the lives of people in our part of the world. OK, so now we are um, talking about the uh, increasing impacts, yeah? Because uh, between 2015 and 2023, there's definitely a difference in the impact of the climate risk. There have been more floods, there have been more forest fires, there's been more record heat waves. So 2023 is the uh, hottest year on record since records actually began. So as that situation starts to change, you've got that being referred to by the Bolivian uh, chief negotiator. We say a great, de great deal about 1.5 on science, but developed countries that have plans to expand their fossil fuels going up to 2050 are running counter to science itself, the very science they talk about. So developed countries have plans to expand their fossil fuels going up to 2050. Yeah, so um, this is the question of wherever there is there are oil fields, so um, an example is an oil field uh, right here in the UK in the North Sea. So the oil fields in the North Sea are shared. Um, UK draws from it, Norway draws from it, etc. Um, so two big producers of oil from the oil fields. The question is, are they stopping to give licenses for exploration and exploitation of these oil fields? Um, I mean, I could ask the same question of um, Russia. So what is Russia's strategy in terms of energy transition? OK, it's something that you can. Um, uh, well, you can write about, um, you know, once I release the question, you will you can pick up that uh, pick up Russia as an example. I'd be quite interested to know what policies are operating in that part of the world. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is famous for his um, very catchy pronouncements. Uh, he's very good as a marketeer for uh, climate messages. So what is he saying? For the first time, the outcome recognizes the need to transition away from the fr from fossil fuels after many years in which the discussion of this issue was blocked. Very true. OK. Discussion was blocked, but now that's unblocked. So that is a victory for the negotiators. To those who opposed a clear reference to a phase out of fossil fuel in the COP28 text, I want to say that a fossil fuel phase out is inevitable whether they like it or not. This is a war cry from the Secretary General. Let's hope it doesn't come too late. That's the key. We can phase out fossil fuels in 100 years, but that's not the point. You know, international politics and negotiations are taking place in a very unique situation whereby they are up against time. Yeah, which is the most formidable enemy in this case. 
And it's very difficult to negotiate with the enemy because the time will not stop. OK, and time is the only negotiator that's not in the table because it's not at all a negotiator, unfortunately. And that's uh, uh, that's what the UN chief is rightly alluding to. Of course, timelines, pathways and targets will differ for countries at different levels of development, but all efforts must be consistent with achieving global net zero for 2050 and preserving the 1.5 degree goal. And developing countries must be supported every step of the way. So this target of 2050, so scientists are actually beginning to question that as well. Is it too late? OK, with our technology that we have, should we even push that forward? Now, that's not been reflected in the law and policy yet, but maybe even that we can will come on the table at some point. Um, Annie Das Gupta, president of president and CEO of WRI World Resources Institute. Uh, so this is a think tank. Said in a statement, Fossil fuels finally faced a reckoning at the UN climate negotiations after three decades of dodging the spotlight. This historic outcome marks the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. Despite immense pressure from oil and gas interests, high ambition countries courageously stood their ground and sealed the fate of fossil fuels. It's quite dramatic, quite different to what some other people were saying. So if you uh, live in a country or from a country which makes um, whose large part of the GDP comes from oil and gas. How will you view this? Yeah. How will you make it palatable in your own parliament to be able to move away from this huge source of income? So that's a big question for law and policy. Right. So now a critical text uh, test is whether Far more finance is mobilized for developing countries to help make the energy transition possible. So interesting, two key things coming out over here is fossil fuels and climate finance. Moving on, Harjit Singh, head of global political strategy at Climate Action Network International said in a statement after decades of evasion, COP28 finally cast a glaring spotlight on the real culprits of the climate crisis, fossil fuels. Long overdue direction to move away from coal, oil and gas has been set, yet the resolution is marred by loopholes that offer the fossil fuel industry numerous escape routes relying on unproven, unsafe technologies. <laughs> so the reference here is to um, carbon capture and storage. Because one way in which fossil fuel uh, industry is trying to address the impact, their impact on emissions is by saying we may take more fuel out of the ground because we think it's necessary for energy security. However, we will develop technology and deploy technology for removing carbon dioxide out from the air and you put it back in. So all of those fields where we take the uh, petroleum oil out, uh, we will fill up those empty fields with, you know, pushing back the carbon inside. So that's what is uh, being referred to here as unproven and unsafe technology. Um, the hypocrisy of wealthy nations, particularly the USA, as they continue to expand fossil fuel operations massively while merely paying lip service to the green transition stands exposed. So you can imagine that uh, Harjit Singh doesn't come from, uh, uh, it's not a governmental negotiator. If you're a negotiator, you're going to have to think about what the other party will uh, do if you start um, talking about hypocrisy and start talking about lip service, right? So the views over here are not merely of negotiators, but also of uh, interested stakeholders and also civil society. Uh, Mohammed Hamel, Secretary General for Gas Exporting Countries Forum, GECF, as well as Haitham Al Ghais, Secretary General for OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, said in a statement, the oil and gas industry will play a constructive and critical role in sustainable development and poverty eradication while contributing a just, orderly and inclusive energy transitions, in particular through enhancing efficiencies 
and developing and deploying advanced technologies such as carbon capture, utilization and storage, CCUS in, uh, as an acronym. They stressed that continued investment in, sorry, um, that's part of, not part of the court, um, continued investment in oil and natural gas is essential to meet future demand and ensure global market stability. Um, very interesting, isn't it? There's not a single reference to climate change here. They are emphasizing more on sustainable development and poverty eradication. So they see themselves as a champion of um, poverty eradication and sustainable development. It's true. Um, if you look at um, if you look at the energy poverty uh, that's there in some parts of the world, um, I was in Nigeria when I visited Nigeria. I experienced about 11 or 12 power cuts just in one day. So they explained to me saying uh, there's been a new government in place and there's been, uh, uh, I think, subsidies pr probably removed. So that's causing um, a, a supply issue. But I think there was an underlying issue as well that there is not much capacity for refining all of the oil that they are able to produce in the region, but most of them then goes um, uh, for export, uh, because that also falls, forms the main um, uh, uh, main part of the uh, GDP of the country. So it's all highly uh, complex, uh, but definitely if you have oil oil fields in um, in a country, uh, it does lead to um, generation of jobs, generation of uh, other benefits, which will help towards poverty eradication. So it's interesting how the um, uh, what perspective and angle is being used by different um, stakeholders. Uh, and uh, yes, a clear mention of uh, their contribution to climate change, which is carbon capture, utilization and storage. So just uh, juxtaposed next to each other is two different views. One view, unproven, unsafe technology. Another view, advanced technology. Yeah. So number of things to analyze. Um, Mohamed Adao, director of Power Shift Africa, said in a statement, for the first time in three decades of climate negotiations, the word fossil fuels have made it into a COP outcome. Someone wants to join? So. We are finally naming the elephant in the room. The genie is never going back into the bottle. Future cops will only turn the screw even more on dirty energy. Finance is where the whole uh, is where the whole energy transition plan will stand or fall. We also need much more financial support to help vulnerable people in some of the poorest countries to adapt to the impacts of climate uh, breakdown. So finance is necessary for that energy transition. So that's the key. Uh, that's the next key issue for energy transition. OK, firstly, it's about how do we phase out from the exploration, et cetera? But secondly, also, how can you finance, especially those countries that do need that finance for making the energy transition? They need the finance to be able to get the technology for renewable energies. They need the finance to be able to put in place institutions and processes for all of the other stuff, soft stuff that goes with the energy transition. So um, those, those are very practical necessities. Uh, required for energy transition. Dr. Aruna Bhagosh, CEO of the Delhi-based Council on Energy, Environment and Water, said in a statement, this COP has largely disappointed on all fronts. It hasn't sufficiently raised climate ambition, held historical polluters accountable, or established effective mechanisms to finance climate resilience and a just low carbon transition for the global south. Lots of terms being used over here, mm, terms that you will see in the policy documents as well as the secondary literature that discuss uh, policy documents. So well worth noting these terms for you to use in your writing. 
while the operation operationalization of the loss and damage fund on the first day marked a noteworthy success, subsequent developments revealed a discordant trajectory. The global stock takes final text lacked the candid acknowledgement of problems and the teeth required to fight them. Well, I have to agree with this statement. There was a lot of excitement when the loss and damage fund um, was finalized on the first day itself. Uh, but then afterwards, yeah, we didn't hear much. To so those of us who weren't actually present there, we didn't hear any news as such. But what um, uh, this person is telling us was um, there was a discordant trajectory afterwards. May Bove, Executive Director of Activist Network 350.org, said in a statement, People power has propelled us to the doorstep of history, but leaders have stopped short of entering the future we need. This is a very interesting um, non-state actors role in climate policy and climate action. Yeah. In fact, it's only because people have raised such a hue and cry. There have been protests all around. There's been a lot of activism and writing around this from civil society, from everyone else. So this um, uh, activist is looking at all the gains in COP as a result of pressure from the democratic base. But then mm, leaders haven't really shown what they can do using all of this uh, energy and pressure coming from one direction. Um, yes, I would agree too. It was frustrating that 30 years of campaigning managed to get transition away from fossil fuels in the COP text, but it is surrounded by so many loopholes that it has been rendered weak and ineffectual. It seems to be a repetitive theme um, by commentators looking at the COP28 consensus and probably the statement that seems to differ most from those who helped create it, who don't want to bring emphasis. They're only talking about, we are finally talking about fossil fuels, but then not strong enough. Uh, Bill Hare, climate activist and CEO of Climate Analytics, said in a statement, the energy section is weak and simply doesn't have enough strong commitments to bring the 1.5 degree C warming limit within reach this decade. And there's no commitment to peak emissions by 2025. The goal of tripling renewables and doubling of efficiency is very welcome, but will need hard work to implement. So um, new things coming out of this statement. This concept of peak emissions. This is an important concept in law and policy because what we know is emissions are going to keep rising. But what policies are helping us to achieve is to try and get them to peak, as in the highest at which they can go. And the policy will all have to bring the downward from the peak, because if it's if we say we have reached peak emissions, that means we cannot go higher than that. The curve has to start to bend downwards, right? So what um, this climate scientist is saying is in order to get to net zero by 2050, we need to be able to get to that peak by 2025. But that's not something the COP28 consensus has um, agreed and uh, solidified into one of its provisions. So the goal of tripling renewables, doubling efficiency, we do need these rates for that transition. But he's already anticipating it's very difficult to implement. There's any number of issues that you can think of when you look at tripling of renewables and doubling of efficiency. So we already spoke about a few of those things. So yesterday we said if we want to increase renewable energy, we do need to mine for a lot more critical raw materials and rare earth minerals, which are necessary for building more wind turbines and which are necessary for building more of the electric vehicle engines, which will be using these renewables. And they come with their own set of problems. Yeah, so that's why uh, 
you know, the scientist is saying it's very hard to implement, hard work to implement these um, specific goals. The agreement opens the doors to false solutions like carbon capture and storage at scale, and the reference to transition fuels is code for gas, which is absolutely not a transitional fuel. This has been promoted by LNG, liquid, liquefied natural gas, and fossil gas exporters. All right, so the cat is out of the bag in terms of what they mean by transition fuel. At least this climate scientist thinks that's what it is going to end up as being. Okay, and um, there's another way in which um, this scientist puts the CCUS technology. He says it's a false solution. I mean, the technology is true enough, but the technology as a solution to climate change, he is saying is false because he's saying the scaling up of carbon capture and storage is simply not going to happen. Costs, technology expertise, because it's a very complex technology. It's not like growing trees, right? And there's also uh, also risks. Um, it says it's unproven, like one of the other person said. So this person is referring to uh, CCUS as a false solution, okay? And uh, talking about um, natural gas is what they mean when they say transition fuel and he is completely against considering natural gas as a transition fuel and he's also saying vested interests are promoting this it's no, i mean nobody else apart from the lng and the fossil gas exporters um, are pushing for uh, the natural gas to be a, a transitional fuel so he's saying that in itself is um, uh, telling us that there are risks attached to this. OK, so. You've heard a lot now. About. What the consensus has um, achieved, what are the main points for action we're going to see in 2024? And we've heard from what the negotiators and other stakeholders, observers have to say about what the consensus was. So now I want to have a discussion uh, with you on what your views are. How would you, having heard what you've heard so far, what are your comments? <clears throat> so let's open up the discussion. Let's have some of you on camera and let's start talking. Have I put you all to sleep yet? No, we are all here. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> OK, let's start by um, all the points you can remember about the consensus. What are the points that jump out to you immediately that you can remember? Yes, Zahul, you've unmuted yourself. So what did you like to say? <clears throat> so I think like uh, the effectiveness of the COP is uh, that uh, the, the, the nations uh, that reach agreements and commitments to address the climate change, like emission reduction targets and financial contribution and adaptation measures. Those were, I think, the most important, to which we, your good self has already referred. And the progress mm -hmm. made, and the uh, progress uh, that, that shall be made in implementing decisions and agreements uh, from the COPs. But I think, like uh, 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 in practical world, <clears throat> the implementation process is uh, too slow, or either uh, that, that process has not been started yet. If uh, and I, I think, like uh, for for me, like being in uh, this part of the world. Uh, the, the, this the climate justice is, uh, I think, a huge problem. Like the developed nation, they 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 have the more uh, carbon uh, emission, and underdeveloped is facing the the brunt of this climate change and the climate problem. Mm -hmm. So I think like like the, the 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 climate justice and the equity that should be a real problem for the world, for the global actors. Hmm. So your verdict on effectiveness of COP28 towards climate justice 
on a scale of 10, how would you rate it? I think like uh, uh, the, the loss and damage fund, uh, which uh, one of the negotiator has already referred that the loss and damage fund has been uh, was a huge success, but in practical uh, terms, it has never been implemented and uh, the success is uh, like zero. So uh, so the, 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 the climate justice is just a, a dream that has to be realized, but still yet not been uh, practically implemented. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, the loss and damage fund is a new one that came in December 23. There is a previous fund, a green climate fund, um, that the, the amount they want um, for every year has been uh, always, you know, it's fallen short. OK, so these are two different things. You should remember that. OK, OK, OK. All right, so um, in terms of effectiveness, one so, to ten, uh, one, ten, five, six, uh, seven, I, two. I think like it's it's been uh, for me to rank it. It's like a three or four, maybe three. OK, all right. All right. All right. Anyone else? <clears throat> yes, um, I would like to say that one of the things that jumped out to me was the transition from fossil fuel. Um, mm -hmm. It's something I've really been thinking about and looking at the conditions or the available energy for us, I see that no matter what we do, we will still have to use a certain amount of fossil fuel. Because yesterday, as you were talking, you mentioned that even with the wind turbines, there, there is fossil fuel that needs to be used in the batteries and, and empowering the, and the turbines. So whether we are transitioning from um, bad energy to good energy. We really need to look at um, the fact that we can't do away with fossil fuel. That's how like, I'm seeing it from my point of view, because um, the less developed countries are blaming the developed countries that they are using too much of fossil fuel, but they forget that they are the ones that cut down most of their trees and bend the trees, use them for charcoal, for cooking, and mm. and they, they claim that it's as a result of it being cheap because where i come from in ghana you will find most of the homes preferring to use charcoal to um gas mm. lpg gas mm. yes and they they, they prefer that op option because it's cheaper relatively cheaper so i mm. think the dynamics of fossil fuel production and use is this a major, major, major challenge? And I don't think just um, saying that we want to do away with it completely is the thing. I think we, we still have to work with it, but try to find alternative sources as we are keeping on using it. That mm. is my point of view. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, we need to get a better idea on who transitions first, what transitioned first in fossil fuel, and how to make sure that people who rely on these meager sources of fuel, which are organic matter fossil fuel, um, are not the first ones to you know fall under the cosh. But we're really looking for big gains here. Yeah, Professor, I have a point to make here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the problem with uh, less developed countries, let me say, or let me just say for African countries, is not uh, in terms of the, uh, the source of fuel or charcoal use, it's not just about the cutting down of trees. It is mm -hmm. about the, in, the indiscriminate felling of these trees, not just about using it. We know it's not every home in Africa that has the capacity to use gas and all that. But people mm -hmm. just cut trees indiscriminately, burn the bush, especially when it's in uh, our time, time and all that. But we are saying that in as much as we want to look for better options to transition from the use of this uh, charcoal to other better energy source, mm -hmm. when you, uh, there are other countries that came out with law that when you fell a tree, maybe for something today, you should plant another tree. There should mm. be a replacement. There should be a replacement of that tree for sustainability mm. sake. But not just the indiscriminate cutting of trees, burning of bushes and all that. And for example, uh, 
like my colleague Kate mentioned, in Ghana there were other programs that we had, like Saga, like uh, some form of programs that I were supposed to encourage people to. When you fell a tree, then you 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 plant another one back. But people mm. were not adhering to these kind of rules. Mm. And we have what we call the agroecology. Agroecology. People are not adhering mm. to these kind of principles as well. So for me, the problem is mm. not just because we are using too much charcoal. But the problem is because we are not coming up with uh, maintenance options of how to ensure yeah. that uh, there is sustainability even though we depend on this for, for survival. Mm. Yeah. So would you say then one of the solutions for this issue is to create some jobs and an institution that can, you know, oversee uh, the policy that if you cut one tree, you need to plant another tree and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, push awareness, education. Uh, but you might say, well, you know, people know this. But if there are people dedicated to, um, you know, uh, pushing this agenda forward, because if you look at the developed world, if something needs to happen, we, you know, have a new office made up for that. We employ a few people whose main job is to ensure that that happens, right? Yeah, so would that definitely. be the sort of solution? Most definitely. That's supposed to be the solution. For example, let me take Ghana, for example. They have mm. what we call... Uh, 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 the forestry uh, um, and planting uh, whatever tree. So mm. every year, the mm. government comes out with an idea that they are supposed to plant maybe one million trees, two million mm. trees, and it is the mm. responsibility of every sector ministry to engage in this. They also have some uh, forestry officers who are supposed to ensure that uh, all the forests we have in our setting uh, they yeah. monitor and ensure that people who use this kind of uh, the resources in these forests are able yeah. to maintain or plant trees back in these places. Of course, it is not effective because, you know, uh, the number of forests we have and the number of people engaged in these activities are more than the people supposed, supposedly yeah. supposed to watch all this. But uh, the problem is if you begin something small by, you know, a step, when you take a step, there's that kind of uh, uh, power to continue to improve upon it. So mm -hmm. when you push this kind of laws and increase the number of people employed in this sector, as well mm -hmm. as push for awareness creation, letting people understand the need to ensure that you either don't cut or when you cut, you replace. It will go a long way to help. Uh, but it is not yeah. a one-day thing. Of course, it is, uh, we must admit that it will not just work immediately. It will take you know, several years to, no, to ensure that no, people, yeah. are, people adhere to this. So uh, we need uh, immediate results. That is why we are not seeing but if we give ourselves some time, understanding that this is not a short-term thing, but it's a long-term uh, agenda we are pushing, yeah. capturing all the African countries together and come up with these principles, it will work. Yeah, agreed. It is about long-term long -term, uh, institutions and planning, um, not necessarily a solution for climate mitigation, um, but we cannot do without it. Um, I can think of an example similar uh, to that here in Western Europe. Um, there is an area of natural uh, vegetation called peatlands. And um, what people used to do uh, like 70 years ago, 80 years ago, is they used to cut peat and use it as a source of fuel because it's an excellent source of fuel. And it's taken us, you know, up to now um, to make sure that that practice doesn't carry on anymore. So it's taken nearly, it took nearly 40 to 50 years for that, um, you know, peatlands to now be conserved and restored. Uh, and that needs to happen. That sort of governance of these areas needs to happen. So that is definitely the solution for that. OK, I had two hands up. I think first was Pankaj and then second was uh, Siddharth. So uh, Yes, yes, Professor, in the in the COP, COP28, there is a mix of significant bins with disappointment, like the how to phase out the fossil fuel. One, mm -hmm. one issue and second is like the transition away from the fossil fuel, like target to 250, 260, like were defined by the countries, Professor. Mm -hmm. So would you give a rating for the success of COP from I one to ten? Six, seven. How successful? 
six, six seven. Six to seven. Yeah, professor. You're, you're very optimistic. <laughs> yeah, professor. Well, you need to have optimism. Okay, Siddharth. Uh, Ma'am, uh, what I was thinking about uh, this COP is, as it is COP 28 at this point, the one thing that we are also studying uh, in our other courses is about soft laws and hard laws and the importance of uh, institutions for uh, regulation of all these agendas that we take into consideration. So mm -hmm. uh, most of the time what is happening is uh, in such situations we are just making frameworks rather than coming up with uh, good institutions that can have the capacity to implement or at least convince the state to go in a particular direction. So it's just here the problem is not with the COP itself, but the problem is with what they intend to do in the coming days. It's just like they are mm -hmm. giving very glory principles like we have to do this, we have to do that. But uh, mm -hmm. I think the most more important issue is they are not focusing towards formation of an institution that can facilitate this. Like in the 1940s when we had this World War issue, so all of a sudden we created United Nations and other relevant organizations. Mm -hmm. But now we are very much uh, stag, uh, what is a slow in creation of effective organizations for facilitation of such things. So that's what I think is the most important loophole that uh, there is no institution for facilitation of these goals. Mm -hmm. That's what I consider a loophole. Very interesting point. Some people might say United Nations is a <laughs> is a white elephant. You know, people get employed in it. Lots of things happen, but then <laughs> the money doesn't go. Uh, but as an international lawyer, you know, you cannot overstate the importance of institutions. There's a lot of lot of benefits for that. Um, good, uh, Mika. Uh, yes, Professor. So, for example, uh, we talk about COP28. Uh, I would say that it was a necessary step in the right direction just to see what we can do to mitigate, if not curtail, the issue of climate change and global warming in our, mm -hmm. in our world. However, in my point of view, it was insufficient in addressing the issues we have at hand. Mm -hmm. it, is in, it is insufficient in the sense that it was looking at it in a global perspective, in a mm -hmm. world perspective, to the extent mm -hmm. that it is ignoring the country level perspective or the, or the country level context. Why do mm -hmm. I say this? Like my colleague mentions, uh, if you look at the institution in a, in a global terms without looking at the institutions in the country level, then you will still have problems with climate change. Uh, mm. I remember some time ago when uh, Barack Obama was the president, he traveled to Africa and said, uh, Africa needs strong institutions, but not people didn't understand what that contest means. But it is the institution that is making this thing happen. Even government officials, government institutions go out uh, felling down trees, using it as electric poles, selling them out to different countries and all these things. So even if an individual is caught in this act, before you, you process the person or to enforce the law, you will understand that this person either belongs to a government, uh, the government side or, you know, has some contacts there. And at the end of the day, the law doesn't work. Nothing happens to the person. So if these examples are set, the institutions are very weak. And until we understand that we need strong institutions at the country level, we will still have problems with climate change. Mm. That's the most important point. Yeah. It's true. It's very difficult to say who has an obligation to do this and who has an obligation to do that. It's interesting you mentioned a government department comes and they cuts the trees. I suppose they're cutting the trees to make a road. They're going to say, well, we want to bring about development to this region, so we're building a road, so we have to cut the tree. And so now you start coming into the question of obligations from different uh, imperatives. So you can see how the fossil fuel industry talked about poverty eradication because they can provide energy and energy to uh, is you know, fundamental for economic development and poverty eradication. But at the same time, it's going to affect climate. 
So obligations. Um, the climate regime, the UN climate regime is not meant to create contradiction and obligation. Yeah. So if we look at interpretation of rules, we know that we shouldn't create contradictions. So that's one of the rules. It has to be interpreted in a way that the uh, whatever obligations are on that institution or that office needs to be carried out, right? So there is work for lawyers to now advise and understand precisely how two treaties or two imperatives embedded in law and policy uh, can work together. And how do we direct action of an individual in post or a institution, institutional policy? Uh, this comes to the crux of legal issues in climate change. Because the one hand, you do need people to develop. On the other hand, uh, you need uh, uh, development for people. But on the other hand, development is a direct cause of emissions. Yeah, that is the role of law. That's exactly what you know. climate change law is all about. So we need some allowance. So the question is, are we going to give uh, that emission allowance to this country, to this, uh, for this activity, to this sector? Yeah. So another concept that is, um, in the nationally uh, determined contributions document of countries, there's one concept that will also stand out. And that concept is that of unavoidable emission. Right? So you already know what is unavoidable from the example I gave you. If I'm breathing, it's unavoidable that I spew out CO2. So similarly, what can we consider as unavoidable in different countries. And what is shocking is what is unavoidable is nearly 19% of world emissions countries have reported as unavoidable. Yeah, so that's a cause for concern in the nationally determined contributions plans. Yeah. So, um, Many, many issues which we will unravel as, as we go on. Let's do a final um, roll call. What I wanted to do is to put in the chat on a scale of one to 10, how effective you think is COP28. I have heard from uh, three of you, I think, on different numbers. I want everyone else to put down numbers. One means not very effective, 10 means very effective. OK, so you choose which numbers. One is not so effective, 10 is very effective, right? So put down numbers. I want everyone on the call. I want 17 numbers coming up on chat soon. OK, so that, did you put your hand up now? Uh, yes, ma'am. I just uh, hmm. wanted, uh, outside of COP, I was just uh, interested in one uh, fact. Like uh, now, uh, I was uh, looking into this uh, situation where sometimes even big businessmen in US or something, and we were also discussing about this today itself in our friends uh, about space technology and space exploration. And mm -hmm. um, nowadays, uh, these technology giants trying to find out minerals or something like resources into some extraterrestrial objects like asteroids or let's say we are trying mm -hmm. to think of colonizing Mars and I was just interested in uh, getting your thought process to how come this can be a feasible option for future I don't know in the next lecture because we are discussing uh, uh, environment and uh, what will be the possible options so I thought like uh, looking at Mars colonization or looking at resources outside of Earth and then shifting production mm -hmm. facilities to these types of extraterrestrial structures. I, I, I was just interested in your getting your viewpoint in that regard. Oh, right. So not humans migrating there, but shifting all our emitting productions out to a different place. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> right, very interesting. Well, if uh, carbon capture and uh, storage is uh, 
unreliable technology, then uh, this particular technology doesn't seem to exist. So I don't think we'll be able to do it before 2050, right? I haven't seen any uh, studies that show feasibility of shifting production. They're only now looking for water. Yes, uh, it's it's just a professor. We were yesterday discussing about this, and Elon Musk uh, um, with my colleague and Elon yeah. Musk said this uh, uh, possible notion that by 2051 we will be able to uh, utilize Mars as a uh, what you say uh, terraform it for our sustenance in a way. Yeah. Uh, as a, I think, OK, I think it's interesting from if we manage, let's say, to stabilize our climate at 1.5 average rise, right? Um, the job is not done because forever after that, we have to keep only at 1.5 because we cannot slip and go further up. So once we have stabilized, then to think about what might happen in 2100, all right? What might happen in 2100 might be uh, we can consider this, but let's say from an international law perspective, what is the international law regime for outer space? Yeah, outer space is the common heritage of mankind or common heritage of humankind. If I just want to be gender sensitive about this legal concept, which means ownership. Nobody can actually own resources there. So first we need to bring about a change in our property system of outer space. So that might be the first job of legal uh, experts to say, how can we establish our industry on uh, moon or on other outer space uh, planets and maybe big enough objects like you know asteroids or uh, that sort of thing, if we can just get it to orbit and not crash into somewhere else, into some planet, then we need to think about the ownership aspects. We need to get our economic structures right for these. So that might be our job. That might be the... Uh, legal experts, the parliamentarians and the um, law reform, because our current legal system might not allow us to do what we want to do right now. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, Professor, I have like a mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not like a question, but it's, a, it's a, like, like a, a thought. Yeah, mm. like. Like, isn't it uh, ironic uh, to mention and say, like, the previous COP was a, a big uh, achievement because a, tens of, a lot of people attended in this conference. But <laughs> like, like, like the, the, the uh, irony is that the, for, for attending this conference, the amount of the greenhouse gas emission created by tens of thousands of people, like traveling to <laughs> negotiate climate action and creating tons of waste, so isn't it? I, I think it's it's ironic. A lot of people <laughs> flew and attend this conference, but then they create a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emission and also create a, 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 tens of wastes. Mm. And then they mm. yeah. totally. Not only that, when I went to Egypt in Sharm, they were actually building uh, structures because they needed to uh, provide for the conference. So there is also emissions that comes out from building act. Construction is a major source of emission. <clears throat> you know, our construction practices are still very, very non-climate resilient uh, construction practice. Um, OK, why are so many people participating and why? Of course, that leads to emissions. Does it have any benefit to it? I mean, transparency and participation is key right, for good legal rules to be formed. So it does have a benefit from that perspective. Yeah, more people need to have, uh, you know, space over the table. How many people participated online? Should we perhaps encourage more pa uh, online participation? <laughs> well, we know that the carbon footprint for online participation is also not negligible, is also not zero, okay? So we need to find ways of doing that better as well. But if you think about, I mean, I have been to so many law firms, the amount of paper we use, the amount of you know, material we generate is probably also wasteful, right? Mm, yeah. So yes, we need to find ways. We need to... Yeah, like yeah. It's, it's irony, irony. Like we cut the trees and then we get the paper and then we write on it, save the trees. Like it's irony. Well, the question is this, if there are many cops, 
Maybe we have to look at uh, which COP needs to be in person, which COP doesn't need to happen every year, right? But again, the question is um, how to be strategic, right? Because we're not talking about absolute zero, we are talking about net zero. So can we classify the COP activity as an essential activity, unavoidable activity? So that's the whole question. So we need to start or we need to think about judging these based on what is avoidable and what is unavoidable. So maybe that's a way of getting a rule of law perspective on you know, these ironical positions that we are put in. Yeah. Right, has everyone given me numbers there? I don't see quite as many as participants, but there you are. It's a free country. You can either give me a number or not. Now, finally, we'll have to, um, I'll take another two, three minutes because I need to introduce the um, assignment question to you guys, which I know many of you have been eagerly waiting for <laughs> or not. <laughs> Right. OK, so there you are. That is your assignment question. I shall send this as an email uh, to Pankaj. Uh, so Pankaj, could you just stay back after everybody has left this call for two minutes so I can have a quick discussion with you as well? OK, Professor. OK. All right, guys, so this was the end of the um, uh, presentation today. But because we are going to meet in, uh, is it one week's time? Um, so, and you can use up this one week's time well. Um, do you have any questions around this assignment question? Is it clear? Do you want me to uh, clarify any doubts you might have? Um, hello, I Professor. You have to read carefully and call back, and maybe contact you maybe in the next call. Yes, Professor. Can we can we send an email um, yeah. to clarify? If um, uh, yeah, yeah, of course any... you can. All right. Yeah, you can Thank email you. me to clarify mm -hmm. as well. That's right. fine. So, so like, uh, like uh, my my question is that where can we get this uh, GHQ emission? Like the the, the link that 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 was uh, on the slide, so that we can compare the data. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Pankaj will be emailing you or sharing with you the slides from the lecture. OK, so in yesterday's lecture, I used um, the world and data site. I showed you the uh, climate, uh, sorry, the um, uh, page which you can use for getting these graphs. Yes, from yesterday. Uh, uh, I, I want the, the, the link up there by yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's the link you can use. OK, so if you have no more questions now, read the question properly, mull over it. Um, you will have time to uh, discuss or ask questions as we go along as well. OK, let me stop sharing there. And um, well, that's that for today and have a good week. And I'll see you next week um, on the 13th of February at the same starting time as yesterday and today. Thank you. 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 Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. OK. Right. Um, so Pankaj, are you? Um, uh, so Vlad told me that you will be able to collect the essays I mean, if they can send it to you, is that all right to that email address? Uh, you're on mute.
Yes, professor, I will create a folder in a group chat so that everyone can upload it and I will send you compile file to you. Update yeah, so that's deadline. that's fine. Yeah. Yes, Excellent. So uh, the submission method is to your email or to that folder. You will yes, you will send me a link to that folder. folder? OK, yes, so you yes, create I will I will I will paste in the group chat so that it will convenient oh. for every students. Everyone. OK, so then I'll make that uh, change in there. Um, OK, um, is there any feedback uh, for anything that I should take into account for next week? No, but I did not receive any feedback from the student that any problem. OK, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, anything that they want, uh, not necessarily problems, but also OK, this worked well and let's continue so that I can continue the good practice. Yeah, so if there's any okay, uh, chat and discussion, just let me know. All right. OK, perfect. I will inform any issue regarding the students days. I will inform you. Excellent. All right, then we'll have a good uh, rest of the evening and uh, I'll see you next week. OK, Professor. Professor, I have one personal question regarding the research PhD. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, Shall I just stop yeah. the recording? Yeah. yeah. Stop the recording.